I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers. Um, firstly, the Honourable Minister Gigi, um, Head of the Education Delivery Unit and Vice Chair of the Education Commission at UNESCO. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you for making the journey. And Dr Justin Sandifer, um, almost forgot your name there, sorry, um, a senior fellow at the Centre for Global Development and one of the principal investigators um, of this study. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to George Werner, um, the former Minister of Education of Liberia. I'm delighted that he's with us today. And also to Dr Kasete Admasu, um, who's a core partner of the Ministry of Education in Liberia. You're both very welcome. Uh, Minister Sony, sorry, Minister Gigi is going to kick off the seminar with a few remarks and I'll then hand over to Justin to present the results of the RCT. I'm going to be asking both of them to keep to their allotted time, so we've got plenty of time for questions and discussions at the end. Um, I think Minister Gigi's slides are just being loaded, um, but please, you're welcome, Gigi. Thank you. Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Ministry of Education, um, Professor D. Asusoni, the Minister of Education and his team in Government Liberia, I want to say greetings from the warm and sunny um, West Africa of Liberia. <laughs> um, I flew in yesterday from California. I told Justin and his team, there's no other place I would, would rather be than here today with you all. Next slide. Next slide, please. Is there a clicker? Oops, I didn't. Okay, that'd be good. Please don't deduct this from my total time a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see everybody. So, uh, good faces. Um, I want to put everything in the context. So, everybody, let's do this exercise with me for one second. Everybody, close your eyes for two seconds. Then open them. You guys are now all ministers of education in Liberia. Mm -hmm. It's a huge responsibility, so you guys should feel honored. We're some of the most resilient people in the world. To put it into context, we have to firstly correct the misconceptions. There was a lot of information in the streets about what's going on in the Liberian education sector. We heard 25,000 students failed the entrance exam. We heard that the president said the education system is a mess. There was all kinds of negative information out there about the system. Then we also realized we have a 4,000 teacher shortage, with an additional 2,000 ghost employees on the, on, on this uh, payroll. We didn't find that out until we actually did a vetting exercise funded by the UN philanthropy over the course of a year and a half. Next, teachers were considered functionally illiterate. Again, we tested teachers and found out that some could not pass the same WASP exam that we give to our 12th grade students. If Liberia is a post-conflict story. We've had a 14-year civil conflict. We started the intervention at the tail end of the Ebola crisis. Matter of fact, we were still in the midst of Ebola when we started it. It was a poverty-stricken environment with high literacy rates. Liberia is a poor country. Schools lack the basic infrastructure, leaky roofs, windows, no chairs for students. In the middle of the second and third year, we went through a political transition. Liberia had the first peaceful transition in 70 years. And then that all to top off with one of the smallest education budgets in the world. This is the origin <coughs> of the story of what ended up becoming partnership schools for Liberia. The guy at the end of the, this table with the afro, Minister, he was the Minister of Education at the time. I don't know who he was. And we, we set out to step some very ambitious reforms. We, we need to realize that Partnership Schools for Liberia was a part of a whole. We had what we called the Getting the Best Education Sector Plan, and it listed nine priority projects. Partnership Schools was one of many. An intervention that was supposed to be radical, it was supposed to be disruptive. We knew that from the beginning it would be groundbreaking across the sector um, globally. And the objectives were very, very clear cut. We wanted to, priority number one, accelerate learning outcomes. Two, 
enabled the creation of student-centered policy decisions. Everything was focused squarely on the student. Then we wanted to look at different provider models to identify low-cost interventions that could eventually be adopted and systemically rolled out into the librarian sector. Now, Ministers of Education, ask yourself, what am I supposed to do? This was the question we had to ask ourselves. In our current civilization, remember we were in the middle of Ebola. We had to do something that would be radical and accelerate learning outcomes. We didn't have any money. Minister of Education had to travel around the world, seeking out partnerships, looking for friends that can come up and help resuscitate the system. And we had to do something dynamic. Let's go back to why we initially commissioned the RCT. It all had to do with, so the government wanted to support evidence-based policy making. This information, this data is extremely important. We wanted to identify successful policies and practices that could be implemented more, more widely. And we wanted to validate the hard trade-offs. We understood overcrowding was a serious problem. We understood adherence to the school days was a problem. At that time, school days were averaging between eight to four o'clock cutting about half of the day off. We understood that we had to enforce the code of conduct. We had a lot of teachers that were not functionally illiterate, that were functionally illiterate, cannot teach the students what they deserve. We have a lot of issues with child safety that were being abused. We had a lot of absentee and tardiness from the level of the teachers that were being abused. We had a, when it comes to overcrowding, we had a, within our law, we had a one to 65 um, teacher to, um, teacher to student ratio. This is the reason why we commissioned the RCT in the first place. The government wanted to be able to help make policy decisions. Now, the positive findings. We're excited to say that the results of the RCT said we increased learning gains for our students. So our primary objective was achieved. The top five providers have achieved about two extra years of learning over the three year period. And I was just giving an example to Justin and Susanna that in the Liberia scenario, I may have a set of twins. A typical Liberia name, I may have a daughter named Hawa, I might have a son named Kali. If one student have, I had sent to a LEAP school, then one student I had sent to a regular school. After my assessment in three years, my, my daughter, who is in the LEAP school, would have better literacy and numeracy. My son would be a little bit behind. So we can identify who interventions have done better. And as a parent, I love my children both, but I've seen the change in growth in one's trajectory as opposed to the next, at the primary level, which are the most focused years. Also, we have a gender focus in learning outcomes. Girls are performing women in primary schools. <coughs> to move on, we had improved school management. We've always had problems with supervision monitoring and evaluation. We increased student attendance. Enrollment went up, because mainly because we had tuition free at the early childhood level in deep schools. In our public schools, early childhood education is the most expensive area. This was abolished in the LEAP program. Also, it was a huge decrease in corporal punishment. This was adherence to the code of conduct. The very law says you should not beat your children. People were abusing children in schools, and it's something that were better regulated. Better PTA engagements. I was telling a lot of people. That's something that's intangible, that's not always tracked, but understanding that we have a, a lot of illiterate parents that may not understand what is going on, but we form cohorts in the communities working with PTAs, and they will work with other parents to understand how their children were studying, that they're doing homework, and that they were going to school on time. This is something that made communities better. We had insights on school safety and abuse. The, the, the report revealed a lot. We're now making uh, progress towards ensuring that schools are more safe. And then we identified low-cost interventions that could be rolled out to the other parts of the system. Now, some findings definitely warrant more investigation. So in increases in dropouts did occur. So we need to figure out better ways to handle this. Some costs were higher than GOL with regularly um, with, with, with warrant. So we want to continue to work with providers to figure out ways their models can be more affordable. 
And then some providers did not have learning gains. In the, in the onset of the program, we understood that some providers would do better than others. They had better track records of success, et cetera, et cetera. We worked with ARC and different institutions. Recommendations came on incorporating <coughs> to make sure it's more balanced. We understood that some wouldn't do well, but it was an experiment to identify from the beginning to know who can perform within our parent system area better than the other ones. Now the minister will make decisions on how to do business moving forward. Now the policy is under the, the policy is complete. Now, our experience can help to inform other governments with bold ideas. Look across the West Africa region or across Africa as a whole continent. Many countries have very similar scenarios to, to Liberia. We're seeing now in Sierra Leone, they're adopting a model that's somewhat similar to PSL, to LEAP. I was in Freetown with some friends from Radisson Academy earlier this year, looking at an intervention that was in our system to be able to be rolled out, called the Master Teachers Initiative. They do it very well in their program in Freetown. I was privileged to meet the, minister, the former Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, and I explained to him about our PPP. When today, a few months later, they're doing something similar. He owes me a check. Yes. Now, stakeholder engagement, and this is something I have to credit Minister Sunny. He's done this extremely well. He reached out to the National Teachers Association. They were at the decision making table with all the decisions we've done for LEAP thus far. We know in the first year there was very much, there was a lot of contention, there were a lot of protests. They've been a stakeholder at the table. They're at the table when we did the signing of the MOUs move from year two to three. He also has been very, very concerned in reaching out to the national legislature. Minister Wenner can attest, we probably broke the record in getting summoned to the national legislature more than 400 times to answer about partnership schools for Liberia. So Minister Sony has made it a very, very important thing to reach out to stakeholders. Again, we understood that the, the importance of data, talking to our counterparts in the region, you have to understand that data does bring in resources Data helps you plan and, and strategize better. And this is very, very important in part of the reason why we commissioned RCT in the first place. And then also how to make your case for extremely difficult reforms. Being a minister, remember guys, don't take off your ministerial hats. You're still ministers. Being a minister in this type of environment is extremely difficult. The decisions you need to make face heavy contention internally and externally. So you have to understand that if you really want to affect and impact the lives of children, you're going to face some backlash. So in your decision-making process, you have to keep the children first and to understand that this is an extremely difficult game. Now, our main lessons, I'm about to wrap up, is we show significant learning gains. Again, we created this program about the kids. And the top five providers added an extra two years of learning over the three-year period. That's phenomenal, and I don't know if that can be rivaled with any program in the world. Providers did well within the context of Liberia. Everybody, please give a hand clap to all the aid providers. Having a real business in our company environment is extremely difficult. Though some may not have reached certain heights as others, we respect and we're happy for all the partnerships we made because they did not have to help to try to make our children any smarter. Liberia is a very difficult uh, uh, business environment. Now, the RCT reports, what the minister has instructed me to say is that we want to ensure that the information is disaggregated. The minister has been very, very keen on the TOT component. Were students that started year one and continued in the program more smarter than before? Have their learning increases uh, uh, been accelerated? This is his primary focus, and we want to uh, request that this information be provided and disaggregated. This is directed from Minister Sonny. I'm speaking on his behalf. And this is how we will make policy decisions on partnerships and how to move forward, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want to say thank you. The children of Liberia said thank you. And um, I appreciate the time, everybody. clarification questions during his presentation, but we'll keep any substantive questions to the discussion at the end. Um, is that okay, Justin? Excellent.
Um, can everybody hear me? I guess the people online can't tell me if they can hear me. Um, all right, thank you, Mr. Gigi. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is you know, multiple years of work that is mostly attributable to lots of people in the room and looking around, this is like kind of a reunion event. It's great to have <laughs> see everybody again. Um, and so the title of the third year paper is Beyond Short-Term Learning Gains, Looking at the Impact of Outsourcing After Three Years, together with uh, Mauricio Romero, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. We've got a lot to go through, and so I'll move quickly. And if I move too quickly, just raise your hand and, and stop me. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'll do a, a brief introduction, talk about the evaluation design. I think it's important to understand you know, how we come to these conclusions, and then talk about impacts of the program across four domains, basically. Learning outcomes, access to schooling, the sustainability, which is kind of the costs, um, and then this issue of safety, which, which Minister Gigi touched on before I wrap up. Um, okay, the motivation, I think Minister Gigi made clear, um, looking at learning outcomes. You know, we don't have a lot of cross-national comparable learning outcomes for poor countries, but the Demographic and Health Survey is DHS, do basic literacy measures. If you look at women, we've got better data on women, but the point is kind of gender neutral. Different uh, countries, what is the literacy rate conditional on having completed different years of schooling? If you've gone to zero years of schooling, it's low. And as you attain more and more years of schooling, it goes up. If you've gone to five years of schooling in Burundi or Rwanda, you're kind of guaranteed to be literate. Down at the bottom of that league table from the DHS, you know, this is circa 2016. Actually, this comes from a little bit earlier, like 2014 data. Women in Liberia who had completed five years of education, these are adult women, have about a 10% chance of being able to read a single sentence. So severe learning problems, severe quality issues in the school system to be addressed. I think that's what inspired Minister Werner and team in the first place to embark on this kind of radical reform. Um, Public-private partnerships, the logic of PPPs, if you read kind of like a World Bank report and sort of the standard pitch for a public-private partnership, particularly in education, is that we're going to overcome sort of this efficiency equity trade-off. Um, the logic being, and I'm not going to stand here and, and rehash the whole literature on private schools, but kind of the logic as it's portrayed is usually efficiency, private schools are going to be better managed on average. They're going to be able to achieve higher learning outcomes at a given cost. We have some corroborating evidence um, for those managerial outcomes. And, but we're worried about equity and we think fee charging private schools kind of are a threat to equity. Uh, we're going to increase segregation and sorting. Um, and so we can have it both ways by putting public money into private provision um, to make them free at the point of service to address the equity concerns, but to kind of leverage that private sector efficiency. Now, outside of education, when you talk about PPPs, you know, if we were in a room full of infrastructure people, you normally talk about a PPP, not for any of this business, but as a way to raise capital. And that's not irrelevant here either, though it's not what we usually talk about. You use a PPP to overcome financing constraints. Governments enter PPPs to raise that capital. And that's a gray area here, right, on, on uh, partnership schools. Um, because the program is bringing in additional money. The question is, is that additional or is that displacing other aid projects? But the relevant point, I think, for the evaluation is that the schools we're going to be looking at are getting considerable extra resources compared to regular government schools um, in Liberia. You can count that as a pro, or you can count that as a minus, but it's just something to always keep your eye on. Um, OK, more theory. There's maybe a little bit too much theory for this audience. <laughs> but, um, so we kind of cited, I want to explain. You know, on the paper, we kind of motivate this with sort of the literature on public-private partnerships and outsourcing. And sort of the, the seminal paper in that literature, Oliver Hart won the Nobel Prize. Um, and so there's this famous paper, Hartschleifer and Vishni, titled The Optimal Scope of Government, um, or The Proper Scope of Government. What should government do itself, and what should government outsource to the private sector? Um, Oliver Hart got the Nobel for this idea of incomplete contracts. It's not criticizing LEAP or anybody else for having incomplete contracts. It's that all contracts are inherently incomplete. You can't specify absolutely everything you want the other party to do in a contract, and some things are left open to renegotiation or relying on reputation or trust and so on. But some contracts are more incomplete than others. And so they go through, you know, what can we do to overcome contractual incompleteness? If we're trying to contract the private sector, 
We'd like, ideally, for the outputs they're delivering to be observable so we can hold them accountable for those things. Um, and failing that, we'd like some competition. We'd like the beneficiaries to be able to opt out and vote with their feet. You know, if we can't observe and hold the operators accountable, maybe the parents or the beneficiaries can. And so kind of two ways they discuss to address incomplete contracts in outsourcing. They walk through the example of private prisons, which they hold up as something that hasn't worked very well in the United States uh, in terms of outsourcing. Are outputs observable? You know, they kind of argue in theory you could measure it in practice. Privatization of prisons in the U.S. hasn't done very well at even measuring what we want prisons, uh, prison operators to do. Um, and the real challenge they point to is you kind of can't let clients opt out of a private prison. You know, if, if the prison is not being managed well, the prisoners can't vote with their feet. Um, and so it's kind of ripe for, for exploitation and disaster, which is what we see a lot of the times in the private prison industry. They walk through the example of schools um, where they say, well, are the outputs observable? You know, if we care about test scores, we can hopefully measure test scores. Um, but they point to other things that might be harder to measure. We're going to spend some time on in this presentation. The safety of the children, cream skimming, who you're letting into the schools, can sometimes be more difficult to measure. They ultimately come down on kind of an optimistic note because they say, even though we've got a few worries here, We've got various ways of fostering competition to make sure that outsourcing doesn't lead to problems. One, parental choice. In the US charter school movement or academies in the UK, usually a, a household, a parent is going to have choice between schools. Um, and so you might be able to opt out of, of this private provision if you don't like it. And failing that, you're going to have multiple operators competing. And the ministry or the Kind of the commissioning agent could say, well, this operator is not performing. We're going to reallocate schools to somebody else. So competition sort of is supposed to save us if we have worries up here. Um, whoops. In the Liberia context, I think it's kind of important to point out, a lot of these schools in the, in the LEAP program are going to be fairly isolated, remote rural areas where this parental choice element doesn't really come into play. There's a school in the village. It's been handed over to a private operator. If it's not going well, you don't get a lot of other options. Some of the schools in Monrovia, the parental choice remains a little bit more, more relevant. OK, that was all theory, great theory. Um, now we come to Liberia. The project has been you know, the source of lots of media coverage and fanfare from some outlets represented um, in the room, from some journalists represented uh, in the room, possibly. Um, and you know, I think this kind of headline summed up kind of the original pitch, Liberia desperate to educate turns to charter schools. Um, but it began with, I think, my most, uh, my favorite and most kind of sensational headline, Liberia is outsourcing primary schools to a startup backed by Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I think it was when a journalist called me for this story. It was the first time I, I heard about the program. Um, now, that was obviously rolled back a bit. You know, there's reference there to a single startup and a single company. Um, <laughs> And as we know, um, you know, that idea of this being all primary schools and one company and one big bang um, was kind of rolled back to a more modest pilot with more competition and eight different operators. Um, and we'll go through from Rising Academies, YMCA, Street Child, Omega, Stella, Brack, Bridge, and more than me, um, many of them represented here in the room today. Um, the Liberian PPP, just to put it a little bit in international context before we get to the results, um, there's a lot of decisions you need to make in, in designing a public-private partnership. Um, some of them, I'll start from the bottom up, actually. Do you allow schools to have selective admissions? Can the schools just deliberately you know, cream skim and take the best students? In, in many PPP programs, like the Chilean Voucher Program, which has been studied, I think, ad nauseum, Yes, originally you could, right? You allow schools to charge top-up fees. There's public money going into these schools, but can they still charge fees? Some, case, some of these programs, yes, some no. Are schools held accountable for their results? Test scores in many cases. Yes and no, depending on the program, oftentimes not. Um, oftentimes the idea is that you know, parental choice is a substitute for that kind of top-down accountability. Um, and then this degree of autonomy um, points to a unique feature, um, which is in most cases, 
schools are kind of the idea of the public-private partnership is that the main function of the private operator is going to be to manage the teachers, often to hire, fire, contract, and manage those teachers. And so the private operators are going to have huge autonomy in what they do in these schools. If we come to the Liberian case, you know, Liberia is a little bit of an outlier. I think, you know, coming to this ex ante, partnership school stroke leap ticked a lot of the boxes that we would have wanted theoretically for it to tick. No selective admissions, no top-up fees. Yes, this focus on evaluation and results-based accountability. And depending where you sit on sort of the ideological divide, you can count this as a pro or a con. I think many of the kind of critics of public-private partnerships who are worried about privatization being a way to undermine teachers' unions or you know, teacher pay, I think you'd have to see this as kind of a, a concession to progressive criticisms of PPPs, right? In that the ministry retained responsibility for paying teachers and civil service teachers, you know, operators were required to work with the civil service teachers that were in their schools. Some of the operators in the, in the room might see this as a constraint on what they could do because they inherited the teachers that were, were given to them. So, just to point out, the library program is a bit different than a lot of things in the literature. Okay, um, diving into the RCT. So, LEAP launched in 2016-17 school year, three years completed, outsources the management of public schools to eight private operators. Um, the RCT is going to track the progress of pupils sampled from 185 government schools in 2016. Of those 185, 93 are randomly assigned to become partnership schools. So 185 government schools, public schools, 93 of those randomly chosen to join the program. School level randomization. What's new here? For any of you who read the first year paper, two years on, you know, some of you have been on this journey the whole way. What's new in the third year results? We previously reported results after one academic year. Now we're up to three academic years. We're still focusing on the same schools and the same kids. So it's a population of children who were in these schools before the program began, and they've been tracked. Those same kids have been tracked for three years. Note that we're not talking about in year two, the program was expanded to some new schools, not part of the RCT. I don't have anything to say about what's happening in those new schools. And then there is, inspired by the events that Minister Gigi referred to, these scandals around sexual abuse, there is a new module looking at school-based gender, school-related gender-based violence. So this is where we started, the map of all public schools in Liberia. Working with the ministry, that was whittled down to a list of 185 schools that were going to be eligible for the program that the ministry and the aid operators agreed were big enough and were situated in places they could work and had all the requisite conditions um, to be part of the program. <laughs> Among those 185 schools, there was a completely non-random divvying up of those 185 between the different operators. And some of you will remember there was a lot of drama that summer about who would get the schools in Monrovia and who would get the schools near the road. And there was a whole bargaining process to see which operator would get which schools. That was from the set of 185 schools. And once that bargaining process and haggling process was over, then those 185 are assigned to treatment and control. So what you really have is like eight mini RCTs. Each operator has their set of schools that says, I can work with these 30 schools. And then we randomly assign, OK, you actually get 15 of them, and the other 15 remain as control schools. So the, the whole RCT is broken into these eight little mini RCTs that allow us to give experimental estimates for each of the eight operators. So bear in mind, each of those eight operators are working in very different places. Some are mostly in Monrovia, and some are you know, in the south, and some are in Nimba, and so on and so forth. The data, we've got data on the school and facilities, interviews with the teachers, classroom observations, obviously interviews with and testing of a sample of students, and then this new part, kind of two different GBV modules, a one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face interview, which is anonymous uh, and confidential, and then an anonymous kind of ballot box, write down your answer and drop it anonymously into the, into the box version of that same survey. 
Okay, um, getting to what I never expected to be the contentious part um, uh, is intention to treat analysis. Um, students are sampled from the 2015-16 enrollment logs before LEAP began, and that was everybody on the operator side, you know, when LEAP kicked off, it all kind of kicked off over a summer, and operators had to scramble to get to their schools and to try to take them over. And on the evaluation side, we had to scramble to sort out a baseline. Because when you launch a new school program in the summer, like, crap, we can't get there before the operator's going to get there. So we're sampling kids from the enrollment log from the prior year. And a lot of work went into that sampling process to make sure we're sampling from the kids who were there before LEAP was announced, if there's any turnover as a result. And we tracked those same kids over three rounds. Kudos to Innovations for Poverty Action's team for tracking 96% of those kids, many of whom moved away, many of whom moved to Monrovia, many of whom went to another village. And you know, it's very common to go live with a relative to go to school. So all those kids are tracked wherever they roam. Um, so standard for, for experimental analysis, the ITT analysis, I'm going to do this in cartoon form in a minute for you, ITT and TOT. Um, but the TOT analysis is going to report the impact of three-year exposure to LEAP, what happens from being in a LEAP school for three years. And as I said on the operator comparisons, we can do experimental analysis operator by operator, but bear in mind that they're working in somewhat different contexts within Liberia. OK. <laughs> so what is, since this is going to keep, we're going to keep coming back to this, what is intention to treat analysis? How many people are familiar with IGT analysis? Show of hands. OK, this is a pretty familiar audience. So like I said, this is school level randomization. So the random assignment is to say, OK, these four schools in my little example are going to be assigned to the control group. And these four schools are going to be assigned to the treatment group. And let's say we just treat all these schools. We don't do anything to those schools. And it's really simple to measure the effect of the program. We just compare what happens in these schools to what happens in those schools at the end. right? Where it gets slightly more complicated, and this is the, the crux of the issue at hand, is that some of the kids in the treatment group are going to leave those schools. They're going to drop, they're going to be expelled, or they're going to drop out, they move. And same thing will happen in the control group, probably. Some kids will leave their schools. Normally we say, well, it doesn't matter too much. They weren't treated anyway. They're not treated now. So be it. Obviously, the kids who drop out are going to be inherently different, right? They dropped out for a reason. They were lagging behind. They were poor. They moved for some reason. They didn't drop out at random. And so we wouldn't have an experimental analysis if we started comparing these kids to the kids who didn't drop out, right? So the standard intention to treat analysis is to say, let's continue to compare the entire treatment group to the entire control group. And normally, when we present experimental results to policy audiences, we say, we want to talk about the ITT, because what can you as a ministry do? You're interested in the impact of outsourcing schools. So you can hand over a given school to Rising Academies or to BRAC. And then you want to know what happens. You don't necessarily have the power to say, enforce that this kid stays in the school, or enforce that she studies her lessons, um, or enforce compliance with the treatment. What you're doing, the policy that we're evaluating, is outsourcing this school to a private operator. And the relevant population for that calculation is all of these kids who are in the outsourced schools compared to all of the other kids. What's particularly salient here is, as we're going to talk about more about, you'll see I drew more gray kids on this side than I did on this side. One thing that LEAP did was increase the dropout rate, and in some cases, increase expulsions of kids. So it becomes particularly problematic to do anything special with the dropouts when you know that the program is changing the rate of dropout. And something we haven't gotten into in the paper, but for a more academic audience, I could spend a little bit more time on. The treatment on the treated analysis has to assume that the program had no impact on those kids. I can only calculate, called sattva for the econometricians in the room, um, stable unit value treatment assumption. Uh, I have to assume that the program did nothing to the kids in gray. 
In this program, we know that the program increases dropout and expulsion for those kids. We know quite likely the program hurt those kids. And so the TOT estimate is wrong by construction. The only thing we have is the ITT estimate to go on. And um, the only thing is the mandate of the MOU included a, an over um, a reduction in class size. So by its very design, you have to do that. And there were three at least double shift schools, which obviously the mandate was also eight hour days. You can't have three, two eight hour shifts. So why don't you point that out in the paper that it was mandated 65 kids max. That was part of what Minister Warner wanted to look at and that there were double shift schools that by, by from the very beginning yep. couldn't, couldn't be accommodated. So the, I think that's why a lot of people say for policy reason, treatment on the treated is a more accurate reflection of whether this worked. So our estimate is we had X thousand kids in these schools. Those schools were outsourced. Are those kids better off or worse off? For the most part, they're worse off in terms of learning outcomes, you know, but we want to include all of those kids. Sorry, most, the average, you know, ITT effect of the whole program is positive, right? This blue group, blue and gray as a whole, are better off as a, as a whole. Sorry, did I miss? Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> not reversing the results midstream here. <laughs> um, and so whatever decisions were made, I know there's been a long back and forth. Did the ministry approve the expulsions or the expulsions done, you know, by the operators on their own? You know, were the class size, you know, caps, you know, endorsed early on or endorsed ex post? That's, you know, as an econometrician, not my, my judgment. MOU, What's that? They're in the MOU. But, let's, let's keep moving on. You know, there's been a lot of back and forth about this. Um, all I want to measure is what was the impact of the program and who wants to take credit or fault for those things is, a, you know, is beyond my, my remit. Now, there is another kind of non-compliance, which we also want to worry about, which is summer operators are assigned schools and they get to the school and they say, actually, no, we're not working in that school, right? It's not that the kids dropped out or the kids were kicked out, it's that they say, no, no, I can't work there. And that did happen as well, even though the list of schools have been agreed with all the operators, when some of the operators actually encountered their schools, you know, they came back and said, we're not going there. Again, relevant for the ITT analysis to, is to say, we agreed on a list of schools, Here's the list. What is the impact of the program of outsourcing that list of schools? And it's quite relevant information. If it's not feasible to effectively run a PPP in all of these schools, that's useful information, but it's, but it's part of our results. OK. Um, preview of the findings. Just one yep. So if I, the, the RCT, I'm not an expert on research, but RCTs always were uh, explained to me in the way that they used to you apply in medication testing. Mm -hmm. So you have like one group of patients that get medication, and you want to find out if this new medication has the effect on treating certain illness better. Mm -hmm. So you have like the, the treatment group that get that medication and the, the control group. Yep. So if I apply the logic, I would rate the effectiveness of the um, new medication also by the people that stop taking the medication by being like, I don't know, they say, I can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, intent to treat analysis is not something economists made up for school evaluation. It's what clinical trials do to evaluate drugs. If you're assigned the drug in the treatment group, we measure your blood pressure at the end. Whether you took your drug or not, you're part of the treatment group. Um, the effectiveness of the medication is the, is the people that took it IDT analysis is, is standard clinical, I mean, you won't get your clinical trial published unless you report that, that ITT. Um, okay, I'm going to have to move on. I mean, Cole, so you're not going to get the summary, you're going to get the actual results. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, first, learning outcomes and getting to learning outcomes, teaching practices. LEAP schools are more likely to be open. I'm not going to belabor that point, but. We show up on a random day, schools aren't always open, leap schools are more likely to be open. Um, there's more instructional time. We talked about extending the school day. Leap schools are doing better at extending the school day and that carries on into year three. Um, in year one, teachers are quite a bit more likely to be in school on that day that we turn up. 
60% versus 40%, essentially. That is no longer quite true, not statistically significant after three years, and that's something we're gonna, we find across a few different indicators, is like the big impacts we found on kind of teacher effort in year one have sort of faded away on average by year three. They're not, I mean, you can eyeball and say there's something there, but it's no longer significant. Um, we do this on number, you know, were you off task or were you actually doing instruction or were you busy managing students during the Stallings observation of your classroom? And there was sort of a, a shift in the right direction, more time on instruction during year one. And that's still true in year three, but those differences, you know, the improvement in quality of instruction is sort of tapered off a bit as well in year three. Justin, yeah. what are the lines on the, on the box? Uh, these are confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals. Um, do, do these numbers include stone bars who didn't show up? They, everything is going to, the overall are going to include everybody. Yep. So including the four Murray schools. Uh, but again, I'm not going to explain the difference because Stella's in here and Stella's in here. Um, okay, test scores. What everybody came for, right? So first, the ITT effect. Um, in the first year, so we're going to report test scores on English, math, um, this sort of abstract reasoning there, which is often used in educational evaluations to say you shouldn't be affecting this, um, probably aren't, and sure enough, we find you kind of basically aren't. We don't, it's not supposed to be as malleable as the other things, and then just a composite of the English and math. Um, and then we come along to year three, our ITT effect, is essentially indistinguishable from our first year ITT effect. So in the first year, um, 0.18 for both English and math. In year three, in standard deviations, is 0.16 in English and 0.21 in mathematics. So essentially kind of plateauing, um, still a significant treatment effect. Um, it's not that nobody learned anything. Everybody's continuing to learn things as they progress but the difference between the treatment and control schools has sort of flattened off over time. Now, going back to this TOT concept, um, this is a slightly complicated graph, but if we have time on the bottom, on the horizontal axis, and the percent of the kids that are still in their original school, we started off, oops, sorry, with a sample of kids from first to fifth grade, and primary school ends in sixth grade in Liberia. So the fifth graders, by the time you come three years later, should be gone. And sure enough, the fifth graders have moved on. So they got exposed to fifth and sixth grade in the program. And then the last year, they either went to high school or they didn't. Or I mean, we do know, but it doesn't matter for the purposes of this graph. And to a lesser extent in other grades. Some of them will have moved on. A lot of the fourth graders will have um, finished. And others in earlier grades may have moved or dropped out, or been expelled, who knows. So we can do that TOT analysis, even though we do think the assumptions of the TOT are violated here. Everybody's interested in knowing what it is. Um, and the, the way that the TOT assumptions are violated here mean that our TOT estimates are going to be, for the most part, an exaggeration of the true effect of the program. If the program was hurting some of the kids um, because they were kicked out or dropped out, that means the TOT will exaggerate the effect for the kids who stayed in the program. Nevertheless, here it is. Um, and so the effect for those exposed to LEAP for three years is right on 0.3 uh, standard deviations for the, the composite score. Now, putting that in maybe more understandable terms, there's a few slides of trying to put that in terms people can understand. Business as usual, we said in year one is about 0.3 standard deviations in one year and 0.66 standard deviations learning over three years. It's not what you learn isn't quite linear in normal conditions. Um, and then the, the treatment schools would have learned about 70% more in the first year and about 45% more after three years. Putting this another way, and sorry, this one's getting a bit small. Um, 
moving away from standard deviations because sometimes they confuse people, the kind of the proportion of kids who are zero readers, beginning readers, emergent, or fluent. And you can see treatment and control, the first graders start off um, quite similar by construction, randomization. The number of zero readers falls kind of after one year and then sort of flattens off um, after that. Um, and then if you look over here at control treatment and the difference, you know, you see the average words per minute kind of increasing slowly. And these are kids who started in first grade, now they're in second grade, now they're in third grade. They're kind of learning as they go. And that gap between those lines is the treatment effect. Um, and so that comes in for kids who started in first grade, the treatment effect is about four words per minute over three years. And for kids who started in fifth grade, the treatment effect is about two words uh, per minute after three years. So, I mean, frankly, not huge, to be honest. Something, <laughs> kudos to our RA in Mexico who was working late last night to put this together. Yeah. Take all of the EGRA scores you can find um, from other mostly African contexts. Um, how, much, how many words per minute can kids read? And then put Liberia, our control schools on that graph. You know, not as for all of our talk about how bad off Liberia is educationally, um, the kids in these schools could read better than grade two Nigerian kids can in Hausa, for instance. Uh, now bear in mind, these are the kids who started in grade one and it's three years later. So these are now fourth graders and most of the numbers I'm showing you are first and second graders. Um, so we're giving Liberia a bit of a leg up here. These are older kids. And then add to that the ITT and the treatment effect, just to put it in perspective relative to kind of third graders in the Philippines or something are gonna be up here at like 50, 60 words a minute. Provider comparisons, I'll do that in one go for all results. Um, ah, you guys really wanna see that. Provider comparisons look um, relatively similar. This was year one, there's a distribution from like 0.4 to zero or negative. In year three, the same is true. You basically got a pack of five operators with indistinguishable treatment effects of about 0.4 standard deviations. And then you have three, Stella, Omega, and BRAC who had null uh, effects on learning after three years. And then here's the TOT. Again, you can see the biggest one, the more than me, you know, TOT effect, is like one full standard deviation, and then moving down from there, again with the caveat that we know in some cases that's gonna be an exaggeration. Okay, access, background information. Year one, um, year one there was a lot of talk about the expulsions from schools, um, and we did find if you looked at classes that were large and sort of overcrowded to begin with, this was the Attempt to reduce pupil-teacher ratios, and the way pupil-teacher ratios were reduced was that kids were unenrolled, I think is the uh, official term, from those schools. Um, in year three, that still shows up. Those schools and grades that had large class sizes, you know, they've still suffered this negative. Those kids are still less likely to be in those schools. Um, after three years, LEAP reduced, and this is not something we were expecting, in the first year, I think it's important to say, LEAP or PSL led to kids being kicked out of some schools, but for the most part, those kids got absorbed elsewhere in the, the school system. They moved to other public schools. At the end of three years, what we find is a reduction in enrollment of about 3.3 percentage points on the whole, and those kids aren't going other places. There's about a 7% reduction in uh, enrollment for the, for the bridge sample, which is really driving this result. So an increase in dropout, and, and we're still a little bit mystified by this result. Um, as a whole, LEAP increases the dropout rate from a baseline of about 15%, about to, up to 18%, and you know, much about twice that effect in the, in the bridge sample. And those kids aren't being absorbed, they're not going on to secondary school, and, and so on. Um, sustainability is really quite simple. I'll skip the change in teacher allocation and just show you the cost numbers, which I think is, you know, everybody said in year one, yes, this, you know, this program is wildly expensive. It costs on average $300 per pupil. Um, 
but that's going to come down with time, and it has come down uh, with time. You know, the most astronomical numbers were Bridges numbers, which still are like well over twice what they're quote unquote supposed to be, but have come down a lot. More than me hasn't really come down, but rising came way down. Um, and the others were kind of already close to what they were supposed to be operating on. So the cost of the program has come down. Um, okay, is that cost on the ground? How much does that include central office costs in the year? So this should be all in. Um, this is their, I mean, it's self-reported. The operators are submitting their expenditure to social finance who was managing, you know, in years two and three. Um, but that includes, you know, the back office costs are going to be in the fixed costs. I mean, I don't want to accuse anybody of anything, but I, for, for the international organizations, uh, like transfer pricing, to what extent are they building in, like, the UK M&E team who comes and visits? I don't, I don't know. But, um, but no, that should be that should be all in. Okay, now um, I'm, I'm over time, so I'm going to run through this. But you know, this very sensitive issue of, of safety in schools. You know, first I think the good news, uh, Minister Gigi referenced. I don't have a graph here, so I just I'm going to say it. Um, the survey asks students whether their teacher ever hits students. Um, bottom line in the control group. 49% um, of the kids say never, teacher never hits, meaning in 51% of the cases, yes, that is happening. And that rate of never is 4.6% higher um, in the LEAP schools. So that's robustly significant. I think you're opposed to uh, corporal punishment, as I would be. Um, you know, good news for the program. And, you know, it's still, I mean, it's not that it's gone down to nothing, uh, but there has been a significant improvement there. Now, Sexual violence, there's going to be a whole separate paper on the measurement of sexual violence that will be coming out um, with our original co-author on the first year study, Wayne Sandholtz, and somebody we brought on, Laura Donson from Rutgers School of Social Work, who's done studies on sexual violence in Liberian schools um, over the years. Um, basically, you know, motivated by the scandals that you know, Mr. Gigi already referred to, in another case in the press reported in uh, YMCA school, Previous, yeah, let me just jump into what we found. Um, so what happens is a same-sex enumerator asks questions, the pupil marks their answer sheet, and submits it anonymously. So in both cases, it's going to be kind of a ballot box submission. But in the first way that we try this, it's a one-to-one -one interview, reading out the questions to you. Um, for all the kids, for a sample of kids uh, over 12 years, 12 years or older. And the questions, you know, we went to the people who do this for a living at the School of Social Work, thinking like economists are going to be too blunt about these things, but the social workers' questions are pretty uh, full on. Um, so since coming to this school as a teacher or a staff member done men and women business with you, sort of Liberian English for sex, um, touched your body when you didn't want it, and specifies gender appropriately, penis, butt, breast, butt, or vagina, forced you to do men and women business when you didn't want to. Yes, no to those questions, answers submitted into the ballot box. Um, and then the same survey essentially is administered on a separate day. We went back and tried this again to double check. When it's just, we hand out the questionnaire to everybody in the classroom, mark your answers, don't sign your name, drop it in the ballot box. And what we get in both cases is quite similar. Um, so these are the two ways of doing it. Have you been inappropriately touched by a peer, 13 to 16%? Coerced sex by a peer, 4 to 5%. Inappropriate touch by a teacher, 7 to 8%. And coerced sex, which is basically we count any sex, because it would be a statutory rape in any case, um, by a teacher of about 5%. Um, the numbers are, and this is something that's found in earlier studies in Uganda and elsewhere, the numbers don't look very different for boys and girls in these primary schools. Um, there's a distribution across schools. It's really kind of a concentrated in a set of schools. You know, a lot of schools are going to be reporting 0 to 5 percent rates, and then there's going to be a handful of schools where 15 to 20 percent or more of the kids are saying, yes, there's been sexual abuse by a teacher in this school. Now, the bottom line for the evaluation, like I said, we'll write a separate paper with a lot more details about that measurement process. 
The bottom line for the evaluation is that none of those numbers are different between the leap schools and the control schools. You can say class half full, there's no evidence here of additional negative treatment effects from any of these operators of the kind that we read about in the more than these scandal. You can look at that as glass half empty and say, these schools were spending two to 10 times as much with outside management and didn't manage to solve this problem in three years. Justin, can you disaggregate it for the treatment on the treated for that? Because this is all ITT, isn't it? This is all ITT? Um, you could actually see what happened in leap schools. There's not much to say because the ITT is indistinguishable from zero, right? So the TOT is going to be a bigger number, also indistinguishable statistically from zero. Like it won't, moving to the TOT won't bias statistical significance. The TOT essentially, I mean, it's not impossible, it's worth checking. So yes is the short answer, but I can fairly reliably predict the result that's gonna come out of that is gonna be statistically insignificant. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Could you go back to the page that had the, the chart? Uh, the list of questions? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, in asking the question, did you ask the time period? Did you ask the time period? As in, yep. as in, did this touch and happen? For example, if a, if a student's now in the third grade, they say fifth grade. Yeah. And you're asking questions, he's in a leap school, for example. Yeah. If the child was touched when he was in the first grade, yep. before the intervention came into the program, yep. he came into that school, is it, did the questionnaire give evidence of the time period when this happened? Did it happen during the leap intervention? Did it happen prior to? Okay, yeah. So the, the straight answer is, the question is phrased, and we did some piloting to realize that kids were not going to be able to say, since LEAP started, especially in a control school, since that LEAP program started over there, has anything happened here? So the only reference period that we found would work in the field was to say, since you came to this school, has any of these things happened? So definitely some of these incidents are going to have predated LEAP. The important thing here is this is what randomization buys you, right? Whatever happened in these schools prior to the program should be equal between treatment and control schools. And then any differences we see should be solely attributable to the program. And the answer is we don't see any differences, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, there are gonna be cases here that predate LEAP and, and randomization deals with that. Okay, I mean, tell to conclude, the one slide that kind of sums it all up, you want to disaggregate it by, by operators. So we can do learning metrics, the impact on test scores for the eight operators. We said kind of five that are indistinguishable from each other and three that are indistinguishable from zero. Impacts on access, basically like the probability that you're still in school, in any school. Um, small samples, so they're mostly insignificant, the exception being bridge, which has that significant negative effect on being in school, positive effect on you know, bridge leads to more dropout. Um, and that's mostly, I mean, we've spent a lot of time trying to look at that number, mostly due to failure to transition to secondary school by girls who report pregnancy um, is a more common phenomenon in schools taken over by bridge. Safety, as we said, no average effect on these sexual abuse reports. There is one significant effect in these small samples and that's BRAC had a significant negative impact. Um, reducing the report of, of GBV. And then these are just the cost numbers um, ranging from the lowest number at BRAC, the highest number at more than me, and you know, Stella did nothing and spent nothing there at the bottom. The BRAC impact is a positive impact <coughs> in terms of child safety. That's a positive impact of my BRAC in terms of child safety. Good thing. Yeah, yeah, correct. All right, I'll save you my conclusion slide. I'm way over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, we're going to open up to questions now. You can get your questions either to um, Justin or Minister Fiji. I think we'll try to take um, two or three in a row, um, and we'll save them up and have the two speakers answer them at once. Um, uh, we'll start with Hannah, and then David, and then Nick. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Justin. Um, just wanted to confirm that seems to come out from the paper, and I was wondering if you agreed with it. Was that um, contractual incompleteness was less of a problem in that all the providers of the same contract had very different 
um, outcomes achieved. Uh, so that was less of a problem than the lack of um, effective incentives created by the contract um, because of, I think you mentioned two explanations in the paper, because of donor preferences. So the kind of the idea that um, governments would reward um, uh, good providers uh, didn't really, um, wasn't easy to enforce because donors had particular preferences that they can be fund and um, and also just yeah because of weak state capacity. So if that's the case, if the issue is less kind of um, uh, contraction and completeness and more this inability to kind of create incentives for providers, what's the policy mm. vision agriculture development? Thank you. Hi there, uh, David Archer from Action Aid. Um, I was looking uh, back over the paper by Steve Cleese, looking at the year one findings, and he was flagging up, I think, from the original uh, year one, that the, any difference in learning outcomes seems to be most attributable to increased contra contact hours um, uh, and potentially a greater focus uh, in the uh, in the PSL schools on uh, maths and English relative to the wider curriculum, uh, and that the teachers in the um, uh, PSL schools were younger and better trained, um, have those same things. And his point, I think, was that these are things that the government could do regardless of, you know, it was nothing to do with a private operator, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that these are things which the government could have done in any uh, government school. Um, is particularly, I think, that contact hours, is that the thing which seems to have accounted for where there were differences? Um, and it seems to me that um, uh, <clears throat> the link between increased spending, uh, you know, is this a cost-effective intervention is one of the biggest questions. And I think in the original year one, there was a comparator to other interventions that said this was the 11th out of 13. Uh, out of 13 most cost effective, or in other words, very uncost effective interventions for improving learning outcomes. Uh, is there any analysis of where that would stand now? Um, uh, it does seem to me that the, the cost uh, incurred, you know, we all know that you're going to increase learning and have better results if you spend more money. Broadly speaking, holds true, even though it's not an absolute link, there's a very strong link. These schools spent a lot more money including much more money than the control schools. And that's the biggest difference, uh, which doesn't seem to have been analysed in much detail. So I'll understand some reflection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think two parts to that question, if I write. Um, and then Nick. Nick from Kaladi. Kind of similar question, actually. I was interested if there are any insight from the classroom observations or other data that you collected into what explains the differential results between providers. So what mm -hmm. analysis can we do? Um, yeah. So I'll start. From in reverse order, because the easiest to hardest, maybe. Um, but a, a common theme between what Nick said and what David said was sort of lots of things changed under this program. There's both, and people tend to want to put that in two buckets, right? One is, this is private sector efficiency, and the other is like there is additional resources, um, and which explains um, the outcomes. You know, experimentally, and I think I'm kind of have my PhD revoked if you don't say at the outset, like experimentally, we can't answer that question, right? The treatment was a bundle. We can tell you the impact of the bundle. And formally, we can't tell you what piece of the bundle led to the outcomes. Uh, but <laughs> uh, one of the things we did in the first year paper was just run regular old regressions and say, what are the things that seem to um, be associated with performance? It's one of the things that I will say, you know, well, it's inappropriate to cite her, right? You know, Esther Duflo was the editor for the paper, you know, in the first year who made us take this out of the paper, right? So it's really not kosher in experimental circles to talk about what happens in between, right? Um, nevertheless, you know, it was, there, we kind of broke it down into two parts. One, there are younger, better trained teachers in these schools, and that had a lot of explanatory power, right? Um, there's no getting around that. These, these schools benefited not just from more teachers, but from new, new graduates, and that explained a lot. There is, though, a big residual unexplained component when we put in those obvious determinants, um, and that would kind of typical economist total factor productivity fashion, kind of call that the managerial improvement. You know, we do see improvements on this, these managerial scores, and we do see 
improvements in like teacher attendance and things, even for the teachers who were already there. So there's signs of kind of efficiency and managerial improvement above and beyond just there are more better teachers in these schools. Why were there more better teachers? I thought they would, I had to teach they would give a pitch. So there was, I'm gonna, others are gonna, what's the most neutral? They were, the decision was made you know, early on that these schools would get kind of preferential access to the new cohort of teacher training graduates. These are still government teachers, but part of the government's contribution was, was upping the staffing um, of these schools. Um, so I think that kind of touches on, it's the best I can do probably on both Nick and, um, and David's question. We, I don't think it's just contact um, hours, you know, or teaching to the test, but, but younger and better teachers is definitely um, a piece of this. Um, and then Hannah's question about, you know, going back to the contractual incompleteness that I started off with. I mean, I think it fascinating over, you know, if you step way back from this program, a fascinating feature is you have uniform contracts for a very similar program in similar contexts for eight different operators, and you get very different results, right? So contracts don't determine everything, yeah, right? There's other stuff to be done. You can draw two conclusions from that. One is like, well, you needed a better contract that forced everybody up to the same standard. Or the other is like, you know, contracts are inherently incomplete and reputation matters, and this is a repeated game in which you need to, you know, either be learning about which operators perform well and which don't, and change the composition of the program over time, and hopefully in the process motivate organizations to perform better with those kinds of consequences in terms of who gets renewed and so on. Um, but I do think, you know, one of my main takeaways is like, yeah, the structure of the contract is not enough, and there were operators, and we've heard a lot of, you know, there's a big focus at the ministry and in the origins of this program on learning outcomes. And some of the results from some operators pose real trade-offs between learning outcomes and other considerations like dropout and these risks of sexual abuse. But other operators, you know, were pursuing their learning outcomes and ensuring all these other things went well as well, even beyond the, you know, the specified details of their, their contracts. So I think, you know, kind of reputation and mission alignment fill in a lot where contracts are, are incomplete. I think the second part of David's question about cost effectiveness, did you have any comments on that? Um, so from the, could get me in trouble with a different audience. The, kind of the response from sort of the academic kind of experimental evaluation community was like, no, 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 no. You can't compare the, compare the cost effectiveness of this program to the cost effectiveness of a small tweak in schools. Um, that's a marginal intervention which is cheap and generated big learning gains. You're totally overhauling these schools. Um, and so you shouldn't expect as much bang for the buck from that total overhaul as you do from the small intervention. Um, I don't know, I mean, if the total overhaul doesn't generate bigger learning gains than the small tweak, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit torn uh, by that. Uh, but it has definitely been something that the academic community has been unanimous about, which is no more comparison to minor tweaks in other education RC2Ts. This is kind of twi generous and should be treated as its own thing. Um, and, and an argument I've made a lot about the experimental literature in the past is like Liberia is different, other contexts are easier or harder to work in, and so comparing treatment effects, you know, from Western Kenya, where a lot of the other literature comes from, to Liberia might be apples and oranges. Thank you. Another round of questions. Um, I'll go to the end of the room now, and I can't see people around the corner. Um, we'll start with Jared, and then Paul, and then John. Um, it sounds like the 30% the of children who are unenrolled could have been quite an important factor. Do we have any insight on who they were? Were they randomly unenrolled or was it the, the worst performing students? Yep. Um, mine's just to dig into some of the distributional, uh, sorry, Paul Upton, um, the distributional effects a bit more, coming back to that slide on zero readings. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, did we see differential effects in provider's ability to get that zero readers down. Because um, mm -hmm. I think that speaks a lot to the kind of 
equitable teaching because having such high percentages after three years strikes me that the providers are not focusing on the kind of bringing the whole class up if you will that's the first uh, question the second one is just clarification maybe for the audience just to put this in perspective of dibbles and what is expected in a kind of uh, developed world just because even at the end these words per minute would be like closed end school in the us sure. so just for yeah. that context yeah no, no no i mean we're talking yeah I mean, uh, Liberia is a different ballgame. You know, you're, we're talking about getting kids from 11 to 15 words per minute uh, for kids who in my children's school would be expected to read at 140 words per minute. I mean, it's... Uh... So I was just gonna ask, sorry, John McDermott, any comments? I was just gonna ask the Liberian gentleman in the room, all this is really interesting, right? And just informs some good work. But it's a kind of naughty question. Like, does this, after all this time and all this effort and political capital and controversy, for you guys, does it feel like the whole thing was worth it relative to what else you could have done with your time and effort and your capital? Okay. Hey, you're asking that to Minister Gigi and Minister Werner yeah. if they want to comment. Um, should we take this one first and go back to Justin? Yeah. Minister Gigi. Um, short answer, yes. Um, the reason why it was worth it is because it, it goes back to my presentation. What were we supposed to do? Um, Looking at our, the contents of Liberia and how much we struggled over the last few decades of war, coup d'etat, war, war, transitional government, and then when we start making some progress, Ebola takes us back another 10 years. And when Minister Winner became education minister, I was also appointed as assistant minister for fiscal affairs under his leadership, under the leadership of President Ella Johnson Sirleaf. We had to figure out something to resuscitate the system and a way to accelerate learning outcomes. As much as we had gone backwards, we realized that it would take another 50, 60 years to get students caught up to where they need to be. And we didn't have the resources due to the minimum. So looking at different models, I believe Minister Wanda traveled to different countries, identified partners, and then put together something special. And the whole idea was to one, accelerate learning outcomes, and then two, after this experiment is done, how can we look within and say, these interventions can be rolled out at an affordable cost? Because eventually we expect Liberia's financial situation to get better, right? So for example, I talked about the Master Teachers Program that I assessed in um, Freetown earlier this year, but More Than Me had a very, very dynamic school feeding program where they invested seed money, pots and pans and food was bought. Students paid a very minimal amount that's conducive to the Liberian environment. And then after a while, it becomes sustainable for the environment. The PTAs were the ones cooking um, food for the students in the program. Also, different um, school health and, uh, clinics were put on that were affordable and sustainable. Increasing the school day, that was a direct result of what we identified in the LEAP initiative. So we started to identify certain things that have been rolled out in bettering the entire school system. And that was the original idea. Everybody in this room needs to remember the providers will not be in Liberia forever. There will be a time that providers will move out, funders will come in, funders will leave, but we as Liberians still have to be there. We have to deal with this uh, situation where our students need to be educated to be able to move our country forward so we get out of the current situation we're in. So I think it was well worth it, and we're eternally grateful for everybody who's contributed to this. And is the program still going to go? Would you still spend, if we had marginal dollars, would you spend it on that? I would say, I, I was speaking in, in proxy for the Minister of Education, but I believe that the ministry is ready to move forward. And we're, um, I was telling Justin earlier, using the RCT results, we did our own internal assessment, as well as the individual um, assessments that were done by each provider. <coughs> Decisions will be made on moving forward, but he's in support of the program. So thank you, John. Good to see you, and I'm happy to talk privately about, to follow up on the first article. <laughs> I'm still gonna write it. Actually. So I would say yes, emphatically. Um, Liberia deserves an educational system it cannot afford. And the children of Liberia, like most children 
in Africa, I don't believe Africa can forge ahead to develop its human capital by governments only. We need meaningful partnerships. That's meaningful partnerships. And we live in a time, I, I hate to say this, but now that I'm no longer a minister and I interact with ministers currently, I see what they go through. There will be, they don't have enough money for the problems they face, mm -hmm. right? The cost, people talk about the cost. One of the questions I wrestle with, and Justin and I spoke about this before is, what will it take, how much will it take to educate a child in Liberia or in Mozambique a year? And compare that to a child in London or New York says, your own children, those of you that have children here. We're talking about USAID programs in Liberia are about 300 to $400 per child. You're talking about somewhere around what, 150 to $200 per child here. And in the case of Bridge, we asked Bridge in this contract to produce textbooks I don't know any of these other providers that's producing textbooks. Our primary schools don't have textbooks for the children. So I'm just saying in a short response to that is yes, and I believe other <coughs> African governments are paying attention to this, and we like this very much. Thank you for the issues it brought up. There are cultural challenges within our system. The sex abuse and the other abuses are cultural things that we have been battling with. Even some of us when we were children, we battled with that. We have to highlight them and eliminate them. Yes. But let's not use those to bury the learning gains that have taken place. That's my concern. The learning gains that have taken place should be highlighted so that as a medicine, we can say we found a cure. But there are side effects. <laughs> that's, that's the case. Thank you, Minister. Um, Justin, I think you had two questions about young enrolls uh, and the zero readers from Jared and Paul. Yeah, I mean, so I can't answer Paul's question. It's a good point. We could, well, we do. We took it out because there were too many tables. We have this operator by operator. We're going to distribute to the operators in the room basically a version of the paper that's only your school, so you can just see. People have been asking, we want every single variable broken down by school. Like, that's already been generated, we'll send that around so we can look at, at that. But you're right, I mean, after three, this is a, this is a challenging number, right? That after three years, you know, um, in both control and treatment schools, after three years, there's still like 25% of kids who are, who are zero readers. Um, is it Jared, your question on, I wanna be clear on the kids kicked out, so the 30%, like unenrolled in year one was from the oversubscribed, I'm going the wrong way, never mind. 30% of kids in the oversubscribed classes were unenrolled, not from the overall. There was no sign that there was uh, gender or disability or ever discrimination. We didn't find evidence of, of sorting in, in that regard. And so the main thing to, to focus on, I think, in the, in the unenrollment results is that in year one, those kids, for the most part were expelled by bridge and got absorbed into other public schools. After three years, what we're finding is not the continuation of that phenomenon. What we're finding is an increase in dropout in bridge schools where the children aren't being reabsorbed and it's just higher dropout and it seems to be driven by, by pregnant girls. Thank you, Justin. Um, we are at time. I know there are more questions. If anyone wants to leave now, then please feel free to go and we can continue the discussion for about 15 minutes before we have to close. So I'll give folks who need to leave the chance to go on things and, and head off. And thank you for joining us. Um, looking around, I can see we've got Arthur, the gentleman at the back behind me, and Alina. Um, I'm Arthur Baker, I'm a consultant. Um, this is a question for the Minister Weather or Minister GD or Justin. Um, so from a really naive perspective, I, I don't really understand what, the degree to which you can compare different providers if they weren't chosen randomly. So it'd be great if you could mm -hmm. tell me that. I'm sure I could just read it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but from a really naive perspective, and I get that you can't necessarily con um, compare cost effectiveness between just say, deworming or whatever else, but I assume we can compare cost effectiveness within this evaluation. So if I, the, my really naive perspective would be to say, <coughs> great, it improved learning, let's then roll out with Rhyde Academies and the other schools that were cheap, get rid of Bridge because whatever they were spending money on, it didn't, you know, what, whatever extra they were spending on textbooks or whatever else, it wasn't helping very much. And then you can add those, you know, marginal tweaks at the edge, like whatever it is, medicine or cash transfers to start a business or when they graduate or whatever it is. Um, am I wrong about that? Um, are, we, are we gathering? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm Tim. I'm from Bridge. Um, <laughs> 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 well, um, first, I think for the work. Uh -huh. It's really, really great to see it. Um, the, the question of the, the, um, the dropout, I think, is a really important one you raised. And I briefly just sort of want to try to understand it better. I don't know if I misunderstood the um, sort of how we compose that number. And I, I don't know if the sort of graduate, so a, a grade six people who then graduated, mm -hmm. if they didn't continue on, if that was included in the dropout. If it was, I wonder if it's valuable, or if you, you may have already looked at this, whether it's sort of what you found if you looked at, for example, the grade one to three pupils who sort of had a clear path, sort of were they more likely to stay in school in the treatment group or control group when we sort of remove that other element of it? Um, I don't know if you looked at that, but it'd be great to hear more from you. Yep. Um, my question is for Minister Gigi. I do not have come from the Education Outcomes Fund. Um, for Minister Gigi and former Minister Varner, um, if you were to continue the program, uh, would you still maintain this focus on learning gains or some of these, uh, the focus on safety and access more explicitly? I'm just interested about, on how you, about how you might incentivize that going forward and whether that's something you want to do. <coughs> Um, Justin, you want to take those first, and I'll hand over to the Minister Gigi. Sure. Um, so to Tim's question, the, the way we're doing this is basically off of a question that asks, are you still enrolled in school in any school? Um, so if you graduated from your LEAP school or control school and went on to secondary school, you're still in school. And if you gr graduated and stopped, I mean, in the US, we'd say dropped out of school if you don't go to high school. But if you are no longer in school, you're out. So it's as simple as that. Are you still in any school, primary, secondary, or are you no longer in school? And in the control group, from the whole baseline sample, you know, 15% of kids are no longer in school. Um, and LEAP increases that rate. And that increase is, is driven by the bridge schools. Um, I don't have it broken down by what grade you started in. It, I do think because when we ask people why, like kind of the plurality of responses are girls saying pregnancy, and that, which is strange that, you know, be careful that it, I don't want people's minds to jump to bridges causing girls to get pregnant and drop out. I mean, the alternative obvious explanation is one story, you know, this is, I can't corroborate this, but we've asked people who know the system better and they say, well, it could be stricter enforcement of the policy that pregnant girls must drop out, right? Um, so it could be that way around. But that does seem to be what the data are showing. We haven't broken it down by, by starting grade. That's a good idea. We'll, we'll go in and look at it. Um, to Arthur's question, yeah, I mean, we, internally to the program, you asked, how can we make operator comparisons, as you said? We have an internally consistent RCT for BRAC and for Bridge and for Rising, um, but they're working, let's roughly call it, in different counties. I mean, they overlap, and sometimes they're next door to each other, but they're in different counties. So just like we have an external validity problem comparing results from Kenya to results from India, we have an external validity problem if we want to do comparisons of these operators. Because one, BRAC is in LOFA, and you know, Rising is in... What counties are you in, Rising? Anybody from Rising here? So, yeah. so we have to compare across these counties. Mm -hmm. And that, in the first year paper, we did a whole bunch of like simple regressions to try to control for how and it didn't change anything. So we're just kind of treating these as standalone experiments, and you can compare them 
um, with that caveat. Sure, I mean, I think internally to the program, it's not an insane exercise to say, okay, what are your learning gains? What are your effects on access, uh, safety, and so on per dollar spent? Um, if I was a funder funding the program, I would probably be doing that calculation. Yeah, leave that to others. And Minister DG, you had a question from Melina about whether or not you're thinking differently about learning gains versus other dimensions within these okay. results. Um, thank you. Excellent question. The now I don't make Minister Tony makes clearly the final decision. But um, the consensus that the ministry learning gains is good primary. But looking at the results, clearly um, a greater focus on uh, access as well as safety. Now, um, and, I, and I'll just say this um, um, openly, Minister Sony, or uh, when Justin and team came mid-year, he's the one who commissioned and allowed uh, a review of sexual and gender-based violence. It wasn't in the baseline year. It wasn't something that was an indicator. It wasn't something that providers were meant to track and improve upon. When Minister Sony understanding the environment is something that's very, very important to the ministry said, yes, make sure you do this analysis so we can understand and highlight things that are going on in the system with, um, in, with the idea of trying to improve upon the system and moving forward. We didn't, we don't, we didn't have um, enough information on some of the things that were going on in the school. So he actually commissioned this um, information to be able to have a database and also understand what policies and what uh, interventions can be put into the system to move forward. So it was in line with what you just asked about how we move forward working with different providers, how we move forward in bettering and strengthening the entire system um, in line of safety and in line of access as well. I think we have time for a few more questions, and I have a few that come in online. Um, I'll go to the. Yeah. Uh, I'm Megan from the Street Child, and I wanted to ask more about how you measure um, because the Street Child's sustainability was really how you went to cross, cross ahead and cross mm -hmm. ahead at the start, you know, um, fixed costs as well as variable well costs. But also, it was, you know, somewhat out of our control because exactly. The ministry's future plan, you know, we couldn't say, and all we could do was try and test things that we thought might be replicable within the system. So, yeah, I'm interested to hear. I'm sure there is more on the paper, so mm -hmm. apologize. Mm -hmm. No, no. But I'd just be interested to hear more about how you measure. Thanks, Megan. And I have a question um, online from <coughs> Osman Siddiqui, who was the country director for IPA, Sierra Leone, and Liberia at the time, if I remember right. Um, Osman's asking, PPPs in education are quite active and odds are will keep being developed in low-income countries. Liberia itself has an ongoing results-based financing design for a PPP. What must this design incorporate to ensure the right goalposts are set in the future? <laughs> okay. Um, so let's take those two questions. Um, so I should probably, like, on the, on, on how is sustainability defined here? I should probably just settle for a less fancy term because really in the short section on sustainability here, we just look at two things. One is the cost per pupil that is just the budget numbers that you sent to social finance and they sent on to us um, to look at whether or not, you know, it's realistic to expect funding levels to continue, you know, at that level. Um, and the other was to look at the additional contributions that the, you know, the other element of the cost is the, the element that the ministry provides directly, which is the teachers, and then to look at what the additional teacher um, staffing is from the ministry for the, the partnership schools or LEAP schools. Um, and the short story there is that there was, you know, this bounce up in staffing in year one that's still detectable in LEAP schools, but as you know, there hasn't been kind of any further additional um, staffing expenditure on the on the LEAP schools after after year one. Um, but, you know, the original, you know, the message we got originally on this program was from Minister Werner, which is the government spending $50 ahead. The program should aim to spend an additional 50, and that, you know, is the target we were just sort of informally benchmarking things with. On this month's question, kind of lessons for future PPPs and results-based financing um, in Liberia, um, I would say, 
two basic things. One is, um, this might be controversial, but I think we, you know, the, the whole title of our paper is Beyond Short Term Learning Games, and we mean that beyond in a couple of different ways. One, beyond year one to year three, but also um, beyond just learning games to kind of consider these other dimensions of access and safety and sustainability. Um, so I think if I was writing contracts for a results-based financing mechanism, I would think harder about making the contracts as complete as I could and say, you know, I don't, I want to make sure we have incentives for test score improvements. I want to make sure we have guarantees about access. I want to make sure you're held accountable on child protection. Um, and this is realistically what we can spend on the program. And so including all of these uh, dimensions, and then second, kind of realizing that the contracts aren't everything and probably the only way to improve that performance over time is going to be willing to make hard choices about people that aren't making the grade um, and to have that sort of dynamic process of conditional contract renewal, conditional on performance across all these dimensions. And let me put the same question to close off minutes of Gigi in a sort of slightly different way. If you had to make one tweak to the program going forward, what do you think it would be? I want to tweak to that's a good question. Let's think about it. Hmm. One tweak to the program. Uh, wouldn't have done the RCT. I'm joking. The tweak to the program I would do, I would, um, <laughs> I would, um, what I think I would have done, I would have um, in incorporated um, more um, coordinated internal collaboration with the different providers. Um, we've seen that it, when co providers reached out on their own, we found some huge synergies. For example, um, more than me, after the first year, as we talked about, started using the curriculum from Rising Academies. And I know that um, Bridge had a very, very low cost to printing books, I, I, I think, at one point. Um, uh, more than me shared um, some of the school feeding practices with other providers, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, we're looking at the master teachers program and running them out to the wider system. So if we had, I think the experiment would have been a little bit more dynamic if we would have said, these eight providers figure out ways to work each. I know that it's been a collaboration between U Movement, which is on there as YMCA, and Rising. They're collaborating together and sharing different um, um, parts of the intervention. If we had kind of encouraged that more or forced it, um, as for MOU, I think we would have really, really got more out of the providers because, you know, together is more because of the synergies and things. That's what I would have tried to keep. Thank you so much, Minister Gigi. Thank you, Justin, and thanks all of you for being here. <laughs>